Hello, and welcome to the Growing Seattle Candidate Forum. Thank you all for being here on such a beautiful evening, and thank you to everyone who couldn't get a ticket but is tuning in online on our live stream. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, bathrooms are in the back of the room. We also have Wi-Fi, which is community, C is capitalized, the I is actually an exclamation mark. I'm just tripping some folks up. Um, my name is Gordon Pedelford. I'm the incoming executive director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Glad to see my fan club is here tonight. Um, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways is a nonprofit that empowers neighbors to advocate for sidewalks, bike lanes, neighborhood greenways, crosswalks, and just safe streets for all people in general. And I want to start by thanking our volunteers who have made this event possible. If you're volunteering with us tonight or volunteered earlier in the night, please stand or raise your hand or do whatever to indicate. Um, in particular, I want to thank Brock Howell for helping coordinate with the candidates. Brock, where are you? He's probably still out waiting for the last of the candidates. And then um, Maggie Darlow for helping with childcare in the back. And Robert Getch for organizing volunteers, and Kiva Napkin and Bob Emerson, our tech duo. So, a round of applause for them. <laughs> and of course, in addition to Seattle Labor and Greenways, this uh, forum is co hosted by a collection of really amazing organizations that are each working hard in their own way to make our city a better place. So, as I recognize your organization, if you want to stand, if you're sitting, or if you're standing, you want to wave, that would be great so we can recognize you. Uh, the Capitol Hill Eco District. Yeah. Cascade Bicycle Club. Yeah. First. Yeah. Yeah. Impact Home Seattle. Puget yeah. Sound Sage. The Renters Initiative, <laughs> Seattle Bike Blog, <laughs> Tommy Schmidt in the BTA section of the world, Seattle Transit Blog, <laughs> Seattle Subway, <laughs> Transit Riders Union, hey. Transportation uh, Choices Coalition. And before I turn things over to our moderator, I want to quickly poll the room. Uh, who hasn't completely made up your mind about who to vote for? Yeah. Okay. And who does plan to vote in the primary? Yeah, everybody. Good, good. And if you hear something Really excited tonight. Who plans to donate or volunteer for a campaign? All right, great. And then finally, who here has a cell phone? And if you could turn those off at this time, that would be great. Thanks, everyone. But you can uh, hashtag us on Twitter or whatever your social media is with hashtag Growing Seattle. Our moderator, Erica Barnett, is a feminist and urbanist and an obsessive observer of politics, transportation, and the quotidian inner workings of City Hall. She has been a writer and editor since the time of electric typewriters, a publication such as Publicola, Stranger, Seattle Weekly, Seattle Magazine, The Atlantic, The Austin Chronicle, and many more. You can find her work these days on The Sea is for Crank, where she's interviewed many of the people on stage tonight. And on The Sea is for Crank, you can also find her Patreon page, to support her journalism, which is also flashing up on our screens if you're looking for that link. And, um, and while the co-hosting organizations um, all submitted questions to her, at the end of the day, the decision about what to ask is up to her, and so the questions we're going to hear tonight are known to no one but Erica, so please give a warm round of applause for Erica C. Barnett. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, um, and um, thank you to all of you and to all the candidates for coming. 
Um, so yeah, I wrote all these questions, and um, because it was my prerogative, um, I decided to do away with your opening statement. So you will not have any opening statements. You will have an opportunity to give a closing statement at the end if you want to address anything anybody else said, or if there's something you uh, didn't get to say, that would be your opportunity. Um, or you can give your standard closing statement, it's up to you. Um, the first question is going to be a two-minute response, um, and we will start um, stage right, so on my left, uh, with Mike McGinn, former mayor Mike McGinn. Um, question is, Seattle is an auto-dominated city. What are three things you would do as mayor to change that trajectory, and how would you implement them? No. Push it hard. I get it. We're in the line. Here we go. Here we go. Well, thanks. I'm Mike McGinn. And um, it's a great question, and we do have we do have to make a very serious transition. And in fact, it's why I got into politics in the first place. I was active in my neighborhood, walking on trying working on trying to get sidewalks. I was active in the Sierra Club in working on trying to deal with climate change. And one of the things we saw was that the only way you're going to address climate change, particularly in this area, where 60% of the emissions are from transportation, you really have to rethink how we how our built environment works and how our streets work. Well, it's 60% here, it's over 30% nationwide. There's no way we get to carbon neutrality without doing something about it. And it's a mix of things. The first one is to think of streets not just as streets, but as the center of places, and that those places should have all the uses you need nearby, including houses and retail and offices. You should be able to walk to it, you should be able to bike to it. That's one of the first things you can do to help start substituting you know, better ways to get around. Um, and so that's a whole host of zoning issues that we would have to deal with, as well as working with um, communities on what their communities look like to get more housing. The next thing is about how we reprioritize our rights of way for other uses. So that would mean bus only lanes, bus transit uh, priority, you know, transit priority signals, a host of other things. And we did a lot of those when I was mayor, and we're glad to see it continue. We have to go so much further on that as well. And that also means reprioritizing our rights of ways um, for bicycling as well, whether that's uh, cycle paths, you know, cycle tracks, or protected bike lanes, you know, or, or other facilities. Oftentimes, if you can just slow people down and make it safer, and that's a huge thing too, and that's going to require funding, you can, you know, walking and biking and driving and transit can all interact much more easily, and that's one of the other things we have to do to get people out on, you know, choosing other things. Um, that takes investment, that takes changes in policy, it takes persistence, it takes working with communities. Great, thank you. And I should have mentioned, um, we've got a timekeeper over here holding up time cards. Um, so uh, when you see the green, you're good to go. When you see yellow, start wrapping it up. And red, you're done. So finish your sentence. Um, or we, we, have, we have ways of making you stop. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, question goes to Jess and Farrell. Um, three things you would do um, as mayor to change the trajectory of Seattle as an auto-dominated city. Okay, great. And how much time do we have? Two minutes. Two minutes. Good. Well, good evening. I'm Jess and Farrell. Thank you so much for being here. And I, like you, care deeply about building a transportation system that is great for our environment, great for the health of every single person who lives here, and great for our quality of life and economy. And transit and getting people out of their cars is really integral to how we do that. And so in the very near term as mayor, what I would focus on is, number one, getting light rail built a lot faster. And there are things that we can do around permitting, around um, getting some agreement on the alignment so the EIS process is faster to get there, and that's really important. The second thing, then, is making sure that people have access to this great investment that we're making, whether we've already made the investment in Southeast Seattle, downtown Capitol Hill, as it's coming up through the north end, making sure that bus access is really good, making sure that our land use patterns are dense and walkable around transit stations so that we have people living near these great um, investments that we've made, um, and then number three, I think it's really important, this city has done a lot of work around commute trip reduction. So if you work in downtown or if you work at the UW, um, you may get a subsidized bus pass, you probably have pretty reasonable service there. 
We need to start thinking about the other trips that people are making. How are we getting to a hospital? How are we getting to um, uh, you know, schools? How are we getting to those other trips that people take that are a lot harder to um, reduce that car use? And so again, I think we need to look at what kinds of incentives. Can we do neighborhood-based passes so that based on where you live, you're getting access to a subsidized bus pass? Could we start to work with um, non-traditional employers who don't have that nine to five commute time to make sure that they have affordable bus passes available to their employees? Could we work with the school district to make sure that teachers have access not only to bus passes but to good transportation options to the schools that are throughout our neighborhood? So when we put those combinations together of great transit, land use, and then the right incentives, people really do make mode shift. Oliver. All right, these stools are not gender equitable. <laughs> so let's put that out there. Um, transportation, not stools. Uh, right now, our transportation system is incredibly ineffective for the people who most need access to it. So the first thing I would suggest is we need to move for impact fees. We need to increase our infrastructure. Truth of the matter is our city's already built and we're not going to be able to widen streets to make cars more mobile. So we need to think about in terms of our actual bus infrastructure, how can we beef it, beef it up faster and impact fees are gonna be an incredibly important part of that. The second thing is how do we incentivize the use of public transportation? And one of those is working with corporations, universities, businesses, and the schools to ensure that people have access to bus passes, and then we also encourage the use of those. But also we just simply have to make our transportation system more efficient and cost effective, which takes me to my last point, which is strategic development. If transportation is not moving in lockstep with development, and if our development lacks a vision, that it's strategic, that it's put in the right places, it's not going to work. So what I would propose is, is we figure out where those who've been most displaced in our city, who are trying to get into our city on a regular basis, where are they at and where are they getting to so we can make our routes more efficient, more accessible, and more effective. And then, we've heard this in our listening sessions when we meet with people in different communities, a lot of folks want the free ride zone back downtown. How do we figure out how to make that happen so that people are not using cars or even Lyft or Uber to get between places downtown quickly when we could just simply have a free ride zone that starts to clear up our streets downtown? So I'm Bob Hasegawa, I'm current senator out of South Seattle. I come out of the transportation industry, so I understand freight mobility and the need to be able to get cars off the road, four-wheelers we call them. Anybody know what ATU stands for? Amalgamated Transit Workers Union. I'm a member of the ATU, former member of the ATU. I drove a bus. I understand the problems that uh, these big, long, 60-foot vehicles are facing when they're trying to navigate through the city streets. So I think that there's a combination of things that we should be doing, actually. Uh, freight mobility is crucial, though. That's the artery of our economy locally here, since we are a port. So we have to talk about improving freight mobility, which is why I got the uh, Lander Street overpass in the transportation budget last time. Uh, but we also need to be smart about development. Workers need to live close to where they're working. And the way that things are going right now, we're pricing people, low-wage workers, out of the city. They're moving to where land is most affordable or housing is most affordable, which is usually at least served by transit. So they're the ones who are having to drive all the way back into town just to get to their minimum wage jobs. That's not equity at all. Thirdly, we need to really support transit. As I mentioned, I was a bus driver for a while. Uh, the way that we have our transit system set up is not necessarily the most efficient. People don't use it because they don't feel like it's reliable and frequent enough and goes to where they want to go without multiple transfers. I think that there's ways that we can set up the system through a more hub and spoke determined uh, network so that people can easily just get to either light rail stations from wherever they are because oftentimes light rail is so far away nobody uses it and use those as the arteries into the main parts of town or just to go to the places where people want to go directly without having to transfer so much to like places like South Center and the, the uh, central business districts. Hello there, I'm Kim.
Carrie Moon. I have been working in advocacy for transit and urbanism for 15 years, together with a lot of you. So a lot of old, friendly faces in this room. When we started the fight to replace the viaduct with not a highway, but heavy investment in street improvements and transit. We were way ahead of our time, and I think now the conversation is ripe and ready to happen. So three things I would talk about for how do we get away from car dependence. Number one, compact growth. I think we all know that the only way to have a transit system and a bike system that works for a majority of folks is to make sure we are planning transit and building compact development together hand in hand. Because affordability, quality of life, livability, and transit service and transit equity are really all the same challenge. Number two, space efficiency by mode. That's a wonky way of saying that our city used to prioritize level of service for cars, car convenience. That was always the priority in SDOT. And we have to shift, as we grow so quickly and grow so dense, we have to shift to metrics that measure how many people can we move. And guess what? Transit, walking, and biking are the most space efficient modes. We have to make sure we are prioritizing them and giving them the investments they need so that they work as modes of transit. Number three, equity. I think one of the things that we've realized in this past few decades of transit investment and transportation investment is the squeaky wheel, the wealthy white neighborhoods get the bulk of the money. And we absolutely have to shift that. We have to look at every single dollar we're spending and look at equity across race and class and make sure we are catching up and investing in transit for the communities that have been underserved for decades. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jenny Durkin, and I think it's a great question, and I agree with most of what's been said. I think well, there's some things we need to do immediately and things that are longer term. I think immediately to get people out of cars, we need to make it safer for bikes and pedestrians. And we can do that immediately. We've done great strides on that, but we all know that there's still too many clashes between bike and car, bike and other transit. So we have to make it safe for people to bike. Second, we need sidewalks in all neighborhoods. More medium term and, and immediately is, I think we should give bus passes to everyone under the age of 18 for free. We got to start developing that culture of kids using transit from the youngest age, and it's an investment that I think will pay itself off. So I would, I think Oracle Lift is good, but I think we need free transit passes for everyone under 18, and we have to look even more at Oracle Lift to make buses more accessible to everybody. Um, even with the Oracle Lift discounts, it still can be prohibitive for people who don't make a living wage who have to travel great distances. So we need to bring that down to make it equitable. I think in the medium and long term is Sound Transit 3 is starting right now. We think of it as a long way off, but I spent yesterday doing a walking tour of Ballard and today out in West Seattle. We need to start having those outreaches with those communities because the thing that slows transit down the most is those siting issues and the fights around environmental impact. We need to start getting those sited now. That's how we're going to compress the time to make sure that we can bring those transits option quicker. And the third thing is we need to be planning what are those rich neighborhoods and communities that we want built around transit and have that transit density so they're destinations and neighborhoods in themselves and they have an array of all kinds of living from low income to medium to, to market rates as well as small businesses, restaurants, and their walkable communities. And I think if we plan now for that future, Seattle will be in the next generation the exact city we want it to be. Thank you. For the next question, we're going to start with Jessen, so we're going to go down the line that way. Um, and this is, you have one minute to answer this next question. Um, what does racial equity mean to you, and how does it impact your approach to land use and transportation planning? So we, at another forum, there was a question, what is the difference between equality and equity? And I think that's actually a good frame to start, which is that equality is the idea that we're all kind of in the same place, and equity is the idea that there are some people and some groups in our society that have been uh, historically for a whole set of reasons related to racism and other systemic issues uh, don't have the same opportunities, don't have the same um, resources in a community. And so the equity, using equity as a way of allocating transportation resources then means that we really need to be focusing our resources towards those historically underrepresented communities, communities of color, low-income communities, 
at, and, and, and that means two things to me. One, not just the piece around resource allocation, but who's at the table making decisions. I worked at Pierce Transit. I was the executive director of transportation choices. After that, I worked at Pierce Transit. We were faced with cutting 30% of our bus service. That was going to have a tremendous impact on the community. And we asked the people who were most impacted to help design the service so that it could grow and serve the needs of the people who depended on service most in Pierce County. Wow. So equality means that we treat everyone as if they're coming from the same place, that we all need the same things to succeed, whereas equity means that I give you exactly what you need to succeed in this context based on where you're coming from. When we think about equity and transportation, people who live in the farthest reaches of our city, those who've been displaced, which are mostly black and brown and low income communities, spend the longest amount of time in transit whether it's by car or it's by bus or light rail. As a result, their job and educational opportunities are considerably decreased over the extent of their lifetime. So transportation, but also housing density, plays an incredible role in whether or not our city actually makes strides towards being an equitable city. So what we need to do is make sure not only do we access those communities for what they need and what they want, but instead of just getting free information from communities of color and low-income communities, we actually need to be paying them to do their own organizing work in their communities. Quite a change, actually. <laughs> so uh, equity, or inequity, I guess better said, is prevalent throughout our system. Uh, one of the most egregious, though, is our tax system. And that relates directly to how we can afford to live in Seattle, to getting to the housing question. So how do we deal with the inequity in the tax system? Well, there's a couple of different strategies. You know, I've been a proponent of trying to uh, get progressive tax reform at the state level, but that's not happening. There are ways that we can implement progressive taxation in the city itself, though, by doing things like charging impact fees, or actually holding down on a lot of the regressive tax wells that we keep going to, to fund good things here, because every time we want to do something good, which should be done, we keep going to the same regressive well, which means that those on fixed incomes, or elderly, or uh, low income are being displaced out of the city. That's inequity. So in our city, I'd like us to have a citywide conversation around the impact, impacts of decades, if not centuries, of inequitable growth. Because we need to all get on the same page about what conditions we've created as a society that have created these terrible gaps in wealth equality, in access to transit, in, in home ownership, we created that system and we have to take responsibility for fixing it. So that's where the conversation starts, getting all that information on the table and then building new dialogue around how do we correct these historic injustices, working together with communities of color so we have equal representation at the table to talk about what kind of future city we want to become. So who has a voice, who's listened to, who gets to help shape the future of our city is the first constructive thing to do. And then second, as been, has been said before, we need to look at every single investment in transportation through a racial equity lens and how do we correct these historic imbalances? How do we make sure we are investing and serving the least transit served and most transit dependent communities in our city? with much as would have been said and I think though the transportation equity begins even sooner than that we will be spending billions of dollars to build Sound Transit 3 and other transportation packages we need to get more minority contractors in on that so they have family wage jobs and those businesses so we can start re restoring you know equity um, at the beginning level and then for transportation itself we have to realize that right now the people that can afford it the least are being pushed out of the city which makes their commutes longer and more expensive we we have to have more affordable housing and it's tied directly to our need for equity and transportation so I think we have to create more affordable housing so people can be living closer to their jobs and for those people that don't have as much of an income, we have to give them more breaks on how much it costs for transit. 
So let them in on the pie and building it so they get part of the jobs themselves and create wage jobs. Second is make it easier for them to live in the city. And three is let them have part of the transportation because there is no equality. We need to do it through the lens of equity. What was that question again? The question was, what does uh, racial equity mean to you, and how does it impact your approach to land use and transportation? And land use and transportation. Well, you know, I, I brought up climate as being my motivation to getting into office, and one of the things I learned was that when you dig down to, into it, racial equity is at the bottom of almost every issue, major issue, that affects a city. It absolutely suffuses our land use and transportation system. We have billions and billions of dollars for new highways, which requires that you own a car and be able to maintain it and use it. And that's what you have to do to connect with a job. At the same time, we're underfunding everything else. Um, the, we, we close off neighborhoods to new development or low-income housing, uh, which forces people further and further away. Um, we take a look at who bears the impacts of that. The most polluted place in this city is right over here in the ID, at the intersections of uh, I-5 and I-90, they are carrying the health impacts of that, as are South Park and Georgetown with diesel particulate. Every part of this system virtually is inequitable when you ask that question. And it is indeed harder on people of color and immigrant and refugee communities That's than that. merely low income. All right. This is, this is going to be really tough. Um, it's 30 seconds, so uh, get ready to speed talk. What will you do, and we're going to start with Nikita Oliver. What will you do to speed up South Transit 3 delivery in Seattle? So I'm probably going to say the unfavorable thing, which is uh, South Transit 3 is expected to go into place fully in a very long time from now, like 2040. Uh, we can make every effort to speed it up, but we're literally talking about drilling underground and putting in place a transportation system that is modeled after other cities. Uh, I actually think, given the way that our city is structured, we should ensure that that project is on time, but what we should really do is push to increase our pre-existing infrastructure so that we can serve those communities that already least have access to public transportation and most need it. So I actually think I have the only real solution to speeding up sound transit, which is create a publicly owned municipal bank. That can provide the financing capacity to look at restructuring the financing uh, program that Sound Transit 3 is in right now and uh, expedite the uh, spurs that go into West Seattle and Ballard. So three things. First, Let's look at getting through the design and planning process as quickly as possible. The siting issues, the planning issues, we have got to work together as a community to make sure we are leaving a lot of the slack time in there available for construction. So as fast as possible in planning and design. Second, look really hard at how we can contribute city funding to speed up delivery of the Seattle transit, the Seattle parts of the sound transit system. And third, work with Sound Transit to see if maybe we could use our bonding capacity or even a municipal bank to get better financing up front earlier. Three things we can do is number one, we can make sure and contact your legislature that there is no $2 billion hit to Sound Transit because they, they passed the law and so to get those neighborhoods now there's got to be planning not just by sound transit by the city so we get rid of some of the red tape that's there um, we need good environmental review but at the same time if we start waiting in a linear fashion for planning this will go like every other big project it'll last forever um, the third thing we have to do is people in this room have to keep the pressure on The biggest challenge for Sound Transit going faster is getting the money available. They have to build everything out first, pay off that debt, then get new dollars. We need to accelerate the planning. We can put our own in our own money to do it. That's what we did to jointly plan light rail to Ballard, which helped accelerate in getting it out to the ballot by 2016. We can do the same. So get the planning done, then we have to find the money um, to help them bridge that gap between um, when they 
when the money comes in and when they need to build it. So we can look at our own uh, sources to do that. Again, we did that before, we can do it again. A lot of great ideas. Number one, speed up planning. Number two, win back the Senate so that we have a Democratic Senate to work with and we can actually go after transit funding. So go out and work in the 45th when you're not busy working on our campaigns. Um, and then number three, there are some ways around bonding to make, up for, to, to make sure that we're getting money in the door faster. I mean, those are the fundamental issues. We need the money um, to come in more quickly so that we can build out Seattle. But that issue around planning is very real. Um, specifically, as we're going into the EIS process, it would be really amazing if we could decide on a single alignment so that we don't have to go through three through the EIS process. Okay. For those of you who don't have them already, under your chair uh, should be a whiteboard. Let's go ahead and get that out. We're going to have uh, some lightning round questions. All right, so on your whiteboard, um, and, I, and th these are no, no talking questions. I'm going to read your answers out loud so people can see, you can hear them. Um, you can't see from the back, or if your handwriting is terrible, I may let you read it, but that's it. Um, okay, uh, first question. Uh, please write down these four categories of, tra of the transportation system users in order of priority. Drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders. Drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders. All right, Carrie Moon says pedestrians, transit, bikes, cars. Bob Hasegawa says transit, drivers, pedestrians, cyclists. Jenny Durkin says transit, cyclists, drivers, and peds. Uh, Nikita Oliver says transit, pedestrians, slash cyclists, and drivers. Uh, Justin Farrell, pedestrians, slash transit, slash cyclists. <laughs> and number two, drivers. And Mike McGann says walking, biking, transit, autos. Thank you all for having legible, sort, sort of legible handwriting. Uh, okay, next question. What percentage of commuters into downtown Seattle get there by transit and what, oh, you know what? I don't know the answer to this one, so can somebody look it up real quick for me? <laughs> um, what percentage of commuters into downtown Seattle get there by transit and what percentage get downtown in single occupancy vehicles? I know about the number. Hi, some knows it. Two questions. What percentage by transit and what percentage um, in single occupancy vehicles? Peak hour? Yes, peak hour. Commute. Karen Boone says about 60 uh, for transit and about 30 for, uh, for single occupancy vehicles. Bob Asagawa, 60, 35. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Durkin, 60, 40. Nikita Oliver, uh, 60-40, Jessica Farrell, uh, 60 transit, 35 drive, 5% other, and Mike McGinn says 50-25, and 47% transit and 30% by car. So who got it closest to right? I'm close. All right, all right. Mike McGinn was probably the closest, all right. Um, Okay, next question. Would you keep Scott Kubley as SDOT director? And, uh, and if not, who would your SDOT director be? <coughs> not sure, says, uh, says Jenny Darkin. Uh, Carrie Moon says no. National search. <laughs> Bob Pasagawa takes the fifth. <laughs> Nikki Oliver says requires a conversation about priorities. Justin Farrell says needs to review. And Mike McGann says not answering. Justin or Carrie. <laughs> Um, 
last question, <laughs> this is just a yes or no. Um, do you support making Fifth Avenue transit only during rush hour? In addition to Third Avenue. Justin says yes. Mike McGann says yes. Just during rush hour. Nikita Oliver says yes. Um, Carrie Moon says she would do the fourth and fifth couplet. Um, Bob Hasekawa says okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. And uh, Jenny Durkin says yes. All right. Um, we're running a little behind time, so this is going to be a one minute question. Um, and we'll start with Bob Hasekawa. Uh, what do you think about the direction the city has taken on mandatory housing affordability, also known as inclusionary zoning? Um, and do you think the uh, requirements in HALA are enough to prevent displacement of uh, people who are at risk of being pushed out by wealthier residents? Absolutely don't think that it's sufficient to provide any. First off, um, when I look at South, what's going on in South Lake Union, they had a 2% set aside down there. To me, that's saying that we don't want poor people living there with us, or we don't want affordable housing there. Uh, it's, it's almost as if they're developing a company town down there, buying Whole Foods and everything else. I mean, <laughs> historically, that has not been a good idea. So I think that we have to increase our housing supply drastically by uh, building public housing. Nobody talks about public housing, but public housing is a proven strategy. It's not this image of building the projects. Public housing doesn't have to be like that. It's just housing that's owned by us, the people, so that we can set what the rates are and we can make sure that things are affordable and we can drastically increase the number of housing <coughs> units available which should keep the pressure down on the escalating costs of housing and we can finance it through the public bank. I'd say the mandatory housing affordability requirements are a good first step. If we got the numbers about right, I think we could have done more in downtown and South Lake Union, but other neighborhoods seems about right. But there's a lot more in Hala that's good. We need to keep looking at multifamily and single family zones, which got shut, shut out, but I think we need to go back to that question because that's a huge part of the problem, part of the solution. We need to look at a tax to stop the speculative development that is part of driving up demand and driving up prices so dramatically in our city. We've got to look at how to stop that and slow that. And then yes, invest a lot more in public and nonprofit affordable housing. We need to increase the housing trust fund at the state level. We need to look at that 0.25 uh, real estate excise tax that was in the hollow plan. There's other good stuff in the hollow plan that didn't get put forward, pushed forward, but we absolutely have to do that other stuff because we're going to need all these tools if we want to keep up with growth and keep housing affordable to the folks who are not tech workers and even the folks who are tech workers are getting priced out of the city. So yes, all of it. housing is a good first step. We absolutely we have a housing crisis now today for affordable housing, both for low income and middle class. People are getting pushed out. People can't afford to let to rent, let alone buy. We need that partnership, so we create that. But that money in those houses aren't going to come online for a long time, um, and we need solutions today. One of the things I think that we should have as a city is the right for those landlords, for example, who are providing good affordable housing but they keep jacking the rents because the property taxes go up. I want to give those people a property tax break, either freeze or lower the breaks if they agree to keep affordable housing on the premises. That could give us some immediate relief. I think we have to look in every neighborhood and every community to see if there's things that the city can do to invest immediately in housing, um, not in building new housing, but bringing housing market now and owning it as public ownership so that that housing is available today. I think that affordable housing is a good step, but again, it's too long from now in terms of when we're really going to get it and we need to relief immediately. I support the concept and I support the, the grand bargain and the mandatory housing affordability. I do think we could have gotten more out of downtown and the high rises. I worry that um, we're, we may deter some low rise construction if we don't get those rates right. Having said that, it's not sufficient. We need to make it easier for what's called missing middle housing, you know, the backyard cottages, duplexes, triplexes, small apartment buildings. I did that work and took those positions as mayor to make it easier as best I could. We need to return to that. I also think the market's never gonna get there for particularly at the low end, and we need to get much, much deeper 
into publicly financed affordable housing, workforce housing, community-owned housing. That'll require a tax source, that'll require using our bonding, but I believe we can go to the big successful companies that are benefiting and that are helping drive the prices up and have them help finance the housing that'll enable the people that, that take care of those buildings, that work in our hotels, that work in our grocery stores, to live here. And that's gonna take a break from the past, but I'm willing to push for that. So we've all mentioned the affordability crisis, and I think that we need to be looking much more holistically and much more boldly um, than just the MHA requirements. And those are a really good first start, and I support them, but we need to be using a whole set of strategies. We need to um, have an affordability plan that leaves no neighborhood off the hook. And just as we allocate growth across our region through our PSRC's 2040 plan, we need to have plans that have affordability infused throughout our whole city. And we need to use the whole set of strategies available to us. Some communities may need rental supports. Other places we may want to explore different kinds of ownership opportunities so that people can get into the market. Other places we need to increase density, particularly where we're building these wonderful new transit assets. We need to look at single family zones. We need to open up the different kinds of housing that is available. We've talked about the missing middle. We need to work with our employers, the University of Washington, as they're going through their master planning process to help have workforce housing. So we've all answered this question with each other enough times that our answers are starting to sound exactly the same. The one difference will be is no, 2 to 11% simply was not enough to ask our investors. The grand bargain went in favor of corporations and developers and left people, especially marginalized people, low-income people, without housing in our city. We should be asking for more. We have to ask for more. But that said, we cannot rely solely upon the private market to provide housing. The city has to invest in public housing. We have a AAA bonding capacity we should be building. The other thing is when we look at the developments that are going in place, these developers do not have to actually build affordable units. In fact, many of them are choosing to pay into the linkage fee. So it's not resulting in on-the-ground affordable units. Also, the demolition and the building are not aligning on a one-to-one -one replacement. The last thing I will say is, is we have to really think about the myriad of strategies that we have in front of us, market intervention strategies, dealing with speculators, building affordable public housing, and more importantly, redefining what affordable means in a city where the median income is going up by $10,000 a year every year. Question. Um, we're going to start with Carrie Moon, and this is a one-minute uh, response. Um, the city has adopted a goal of zero pedestrian fatalities or serious injuries by 2030, and yet in the past several years, pedestrian deaths and serious injuries have remained steady or increased. Um, as mayor, what would you do to provide safe places for people to walk in Seattle, and how will you prioritize which projects get funded? And you will get extra points for not just saying sidewalks. <laughs> So number one, funding. We have made this commitment to Vision Zero, but there is not enough funding put towards making it reality. So that's the first priority, is get it funded. Second, we have to look at reducing speeds everywhere, and we have to look at all the physical design issues around intersections and around streets. When cars feel like they're on a highway on-ramp, when they feel like they're on an arterial, they go fast, and that's how people die. So we have got to change the way we design streets so that people slow down and realize, oh, I'm sharing this space with other humans. I better be careful. And so sidewalk inter sidewalks, intersection design, street design, and, and slower speeds, and actually funding the Vision Zero priorities are the way to do this. And we've got to get away from level of service for cars, stop using that as our metric, and start using pedestrian safety and bikeability and transit access as metrics instead. I'm going to say everything she said, um, plus sidewalks. No. Uh, uh, and I think the other thing we have to do is, as we're planning these projects, remember that people are walking. Um, and there's too many times when we roll out our bus routes or we roll out, you know, the new cable car routes and we're not thinking about the bikes and pedestrians who are using those things too. So we have to bring that lens in every part of the planning we do. Um, we also need the funding. We'll use Bob's Bank. 
Um, and we, we, if it's a priority, it'll happen. And I think that the, the thing that we've seen is we've given a good name and people do incremental changes, but then other priorities take over. It has to be a consistent priority and that leadership comes from the mayor's office in conjunction with working with the council. So we need all the things that Carrie said and then I think we also have to, every time we plan one of these new projects, be thinking, how are the bikes going to get around? How are the pedestrians going to get around? If this is really the future we want where there's fewer cars, let's plan for it and do it now. That objective of uh, zero deaths or, or serious injuries was announced actually in 2012 as part of the road safety action plan that, that we developed. And we talk about a number of things in that, you know, education, um, enforcement, and engineering. But really it's engineering is the most important one, and, and it's been referenced before. If people feel like they can drive fast, they will drive fast. And so you have to finance changes to how you build your roadways. We did that, for example, by implementing uh, speeding cameras outside of schools. You know, the number of tickets is going down, not just because people are getting tickets, because we, we used all of that money and the city continues to use it to make safer walking routes to schools. But let's be clear, whenever we change the rights of way to make them safer, it's really controversial. I discovered this, everybody here is going to discover this if, they, if they're so fortunate enough to be in office. And you have to be willing to stand firm, you know, and say, we're going to put in a safe, protected bike lane, or we're going to put in a bike lane if it makes it easier for people to cross the street. You know, we're going to make these changes because even one death is just too many. Thank you. So there are several ways to achieve uh, pedestrian safety. We've talked about many of them. I'd like to highlight, um, particularly with respect to cars, we need to slow cars down, and we know that as people are in love with their cell phones, there is an increase in distracted driving. And so the state has passed a really strict distracted driving law. But we need to make sure, even with good infrastructure, we're seeing an increase in pedestrian deaths because people just aren't paying attention. So that's something that we need to do at the city level to work with our state partners to enforce that. Secondly, engineering does matter, but it's not just sidewalks and, and crosswalks. We need to think about things like lighting in, in certain neighborhoods. We need to think about things like um, make, there may uh, be sidewalks, but they may not be accessible. They may not be wheelchair accessible. They may not be accessible for the, for the elderly. So as we're working to build out our sidewalk infrastructure, we also need to take care of the sidewalks that we have and make sure that they're accessible for all users, regardless of ability or age. Um, and then thirdly, with respect to funding, we do need to make sure that we are asking developers to pay their fair share, and we should also be asking people who park and allow neighborhoods to keep parking fees to improve sidewalks in those neighborhoods. So I think there's a lot of options here. I'll speak first to infrastructure. Yes, sidewalks are important. I'm a runner, and in my neighborhood over in Del Ridge, we have no sidewalks, so it can be very scary. Uh, but I would also add street lights, and making sure that we have roundabouts, but also addressing just simple signage. There are plenty of places in my neighborhood where there are crosswalks, but there's nothing indicating to a driver that you should stop. And as a runner, multiple times, I've almost been hit. The other thing I would add, which I actually think it, it hasn't been said, is really thinking about education. Culture shifting is pertinent when we make policy shifts or we make street shifts. Where I grew up in Indiana, to get your license, you had to go through some sort of driver's ed program. I think we should find ways in Seattle to make not just driver's ed, but cycling ed accessible for all young people. So they know cycling is an option, so they know what cyclists are doing on the road. So that there's some sort of shared acknowledgement that there are other people other than cars driving, because who's more distracted than a 16-year-old driving? <laughs> Pedestrian safety is a personal issue for me. Uh, I had a good friend who was actually run down in a crosswalk in West Seattle, Tatsu Nakata, who um, was a legislative assistant, a rising star in the Asian community. But that intersection had had numerous complaints before, and actually not long before he was hit, uh, was there was a complaint called in, and uh, nothing was done. So. While we do a lot of these good things, and there are a lot of tax and tactics that we can use, engineering strategies and whatnot, to, to lower uh, pedestrian fatalities, we need to really, we say a lot of warm and fuzzy things, but they're just words. You know, we, we voted to, 
uh, the council moved to eliminate homelessness by what, two years ago or something like that? I mean, they voted 10 years ago to eliminate it two years ago. So, uh, you know, when we, they built light rail at grade in South Seattle, there was a prediction by an engineering firm that there would be 24 deaths caused by that. In fact, last, last uh, two years, uh, two months ago, there was a fatality. They were jacking the car up off of the body in South Seattle. So we need to... Okay, yes. I, uh, my system is confusing. I apologize. Um, so um, now you have 30 seconds to answer the following question. Um, if elected, you will serve on the Sound Transit Board. Um, what are your top three priorities as a member of the regional body overseeing light rail construction? That's a great question. Um, it's a really important position that the mayor has. Number one, you have to make sure you advocate that those positions do not become directly elected. There is a move by the right's wing that they want to kill sound transit, and so they want those elected, not appointed. Number two, you've got to work and use your bully pulpit to make sure that we really are doing all we can that we've discussed here tonight to try to speed up and condense the delivery of sound transit. And the third thing you have to do, I think, is as you're bringing it online, you're making sure that that transit is delivering the benefits you promised in neighborhoods, and that development is happening at the same time. So when the trains arrive, the communities are there. First is trying to make sure we accelerate the Seattle projects, while also being respectful of the fact that the rest of the region wants it too. So that's number one. Um, number two, would be getting more housing near the transit. We have to take advantage of this investment and allow people to live near the stations. And the third one would be the access to and from the stations. You know, right now we're building a no no sound. There we go. There we go again. Okay. Will you let me start again? I can keep it really tight. Or did you hear sure, that? Sure, it's a 30 Thank second you. question. 30 okay. seconds, right. Okay, one, accelerate sound transit for Seattle while respecting that the rest of the region wants to proceed, so we're going to do so in a way that maintains the financial sustainability and the viability of the entire system. Two, um, get housing near transit. Um, that's absolutely essential if we're going to be making this multi-billion dollar investment. More people should be able to enjoy it. And the third thing would be the access to the stations. Instead of surrounding them with parking lots, we have to make sure people can get to it by walking or biking or, tra or other transit. And, and again, that's kind of a culture shift, I think. It's easier for us here. Out in the region, it's harder, but we can help with that. As mayor, I would love to be on the Sound Transit Board, and I would love the opportunity to really make sure that we are implementing the Sound Transit 2 and 3 program as quickly and efficiently as we can. Um, number two, that housing piece is really important. And as um, in the legislature in 2015, we passed some of the most innovative uh, legislation around affordable housing near transit stations. And we need to really work to make that legislation work so that we really are realizing the benefits of using sound transit surplus property for low income housing. Thirdly, we can coordinate with other transit systems and get more efficiency out of the system as a whole to get more service to stations. So we need to have the right people at the table and this especially includes having folks from underrepresented communities and ensuring that their time is paid for. Uh, the second is we keep talking about speeding up the planning process and that's one of the major problems in Seattle is we lack vision. We speed up planning processes without actually consulting neighborhoods that should be involved in the process so it leads to inequity. So I really actually push back against that. The third thing is that ST3 is a regional project. Is Seattle as a city the part of the region that most needs the speed up of access? If it's not, then we're being inequitable when we think about SD3 as something that regionally gives transportation access to people who most need it. So as a member of the board, I would bring an equity lens uh, for the decision-making process, but I would also be a pragmatist. I'd look at all of the options. So we, for instance, there's a study done that said if we provided free transit throughout the system, it would cost $4.5 billion over 20 years, but would move 190,000 people a day compared to the sound transit full build out at 64,000 a day. So for a bang for a buck, yes, we could 
It's ST3, we're going to build that as an artery flow, but we should be creating more uh, commutes to the stations. All right, we've already talked about speeding up the process and getting Seattle projects done faster and uh, getting the, the funding in place to build the whole system. Second would be equitable transit-oriented development, and I think two really important projects to look at are the Capitol Hill Light Rail Station, where the community was so involved in determining priorities and what they wanted built over their station, as well as the Liberty Bank Building, which is one of the few projects where the community is actually involved in making sure the new development builds wealth in the community. And then third, the Missing Mile Challenge, we've got to make sure transit, biking, walking to the stations works. three lightning round questions. Um, number one, uh, do you support a, pro a progressive income tax in Seattle? Um, and if I recall correctly, I think you're all going to say yes. Uh, no, but the second part of that question is, um, what is one other thing you would do to shift Seattle toward a more equitable tax structure? And can people leave their boards up all at the same time? <laughs> that would help. Thank you. Yes. Bob Hasegawa says yes and state bank. Carrie Moon says yes and state capital gains tax. Uh, Justin, uh, Jenny Durkin says uh, yes and lower B&O tax. Justin Farrell says yes and impact fees. Mike McGann is writing a novel. Uh, he <laughs> says yes, tax big corporations exempt more small businesses. And did I miss? Oh, and Nikita Oliver says yes. Fiscal priorities to stop revenue. To can you read it? Sorry. <laughs> so addressing the use of how we use the budget we already have, our fiscal priorities, actually moving things around to serve what we really need in our city, so we don't continue to renew things like levies over and over again. Great. Um, all right. Next lightning round question. Um, City Council uh, is about to take up reforms to the design review process uh, that are aimed at simplifying the process and reducing the amount of time and money it takes to build homes in Seattle. Do you support these proposed changes? Yeah. City Council is about to take up uh, ref uh, changes to the design review process that are aimed at simplifying the process and reducing the amount of time and money it takes to build homes in Seattle. Do you support these proposed changes? Jenny Durkin says not uh, yes, but not at the sacrifice of the environment. Carrie Moon says yes in theory. Uh, Bob Hasegawa says I'm for reform. Uh, or Arias, Arias. Arias. Regulatory, uh, it's, it's I know o OIRA, but what's o what's o OREA? The office of red tape. <laughs> All right. Rid of red tape. All right. Yeah. Uh, Nikita Oliver, yes, if it serves equity and not corporations. Justin Farrell, need to review specific support generally, but community process matters and might begin. Support reform, but need a closer look. All right. Um, and the last one uh, for this round is, do you support the sale of the Convention Place Station and the granting of public streets and alleys for expansion of the Washington State Convention Center? Uh, Bob Hasegawa says yes if we get a fair return. Uh, Carrie Moon says yes if the package is good. Uh, Jenny Durkin says yes, but with real public benefits. Mike McGinn appears to be say, uh, Mike McGinn says no. Uh, Justin Farrell says generally yes, but need to continue to work on public benefits. And Nikita Oliver says stop selling public properties. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, this is a one minute question um, and we'll start with Mike McGinn. Um, Amazon has plans to hire tens of thousands of employees in Seattle over the next few years and current housing plans will not absorb that growth without, without putting more pressure on housing prices. What will you do to add more housing in Seattle, particularly mi missing middle housing, um, like duplexes and backyard cottages in neighborhoods that are now exclusively single family? Yeah, well, 
I, I do support this, but I think we also need to have a dialogue with the public that this needs to happen, and we need to listen to the public about what they want to see in their neighborhoods as well. Um, I don't think this can be imposed top down. I think we need to have a dialogue. Just from my own experience, I know that if people know that they're heard, and if they can have neighborhood priorities funded, we're going to get further. And by the way, just look at, read this article about how Bremerton dealt with all of the workers coming in during the war boom. And, and you know, long ago during World War II, they just built a lot of housing, and it was a lot of different types. We can do that, and and I support that. But we also need, as I said earlier, to ask these companies that are doing so well, that are benefiting so much from the city that we built, and and the uh, vitality that's here, the great people that they come here to hire, right? They need to contribute more. We need to ask them to contribute more so that we can start building the amount of public and community-owned housing that we need to support the workforce as well. Can you repeat the question? Uh, Amazon has plans to hire tens of thousands of, of workers over the next few years, um, and current housing plans won't absorb that growth without putting more pressure on housing prices. Uh, what will you do to add more housing, particularly missing middle housing like duplexes? So we've talked a lot about a whole array of options to make sure that we have much more housing options throughout the city, density, different kinds of ownership models. Um, with respect to the missing middle specifically, I think that we should work with employers um, and work with particularly public employers like the University of Washington to see if we can put, as they're going through their master planning process, to see if they can put um, uh, workforce housing there to house adjunct faculty and, to, and other people who are providing services but can't buy into the market. Same with some of our hospitals in our community. So that's, that's something we should do. We need to support more density throughout the city. As we're doing it, we also need to be doing things like making sure we're protecting our tree canopy, making sure that we're inventory and culture, uh, cultural assets so that we're not losing things around um, cultural diversity and, and other things that really make this city special. And so while I believe, and I said this earlier, we need a plan that leaves no neighborhood off the hook, community process does matter, and there are ways to get um, community input that's meaningful and allows us to move forward on accommodating more people. So our city desperately needs strategic density, and that's density that works closely with the neighborhoods to determine where that density would be most useful, but also would allow neighborhoods to preserve the culture of their spaces. As a city, we need to acknowledge that neighborhoods like Ballard have taken on inequitable amounts of the density in ways that have actually disturbed the, the stability and the culture of the neighborhood. And so density needs to be spread out more equitably throughout our city. One idea that I've talked about uh, with other housing advocates is when we look at the uh, suggestion of having in-laws, the Adus and the Dadus, uh, how can we make that process less restrictive? Because there are restrictions on that that makes it almost impossible for people in certain neighborhoods to contribute it. So one idea is maybe we could exchange restrictions for a commitment to be rent stabilized and serve a specific housing market in that uh, 30 to 60 percent worker area and in exchange for lessening those restrictions on people who want to build affordable housing on their properties. So this is one of those areas where I think we need to really implement small d democracy and give empower the neighborhood councils again that were defunded and disempowered and let them make decisions on how they want to absorb density. So I would do that by increasing their budget and give them an organizing plan, help them develop community buy-in, give them authority to spend significant budget on how they want that money spent within their neighborhoods in return for that privilege to accept the responsibility of deciding how they want to accept their fair share of the density. Is it through this missing middle? Is it through core urban villages? Is it through accessory dwelling units? Not a decision coming from the top down, you neighborhood will do this. Let the neighborhood decide how they want to absorb their fair share of the density in return for budget writing authority over a significant neighborhood budget. question a lot in our city and there's one thing a big thing that it misses we always assume that people are going to move from outside to take these tech jobs 
Why are we not building better pathways to these tech jobs for high school kids from Seattle, especially low-income kids who do not have the pathway to go to a four-year college? Can we do anything in the community college system to help them prepare for jobs in tech so that they can have these good, well-paying jobs? Second, we need to really look at our land use code, our permitting process, the thresholds for environmental review. We've created a terrible problem in single family land where people think they don't want any more growth because the growth they see is not the kind of housing they like. If we could make more flexible zoning that was performance based, we could be looking at community land trusts, congregate housing, backyard cottages, row houses, duplexes. There's all these great models besides the four pack over a garage court that people would be willing to accept if we could make our process work for them and that's we need to go there working with low with the developers and low-income housing providers who know how to do that i think that uh justin's exactly right every neighborhood is going to have to absorb more density and there's no question about that we need immediately i think for some residential neighborhoods to make permitting for mother-in-laws adu and dadus easier tomorrow so that we create housing and then we need to have those conversations about how we add additional density there the second thing we need to do is where there's some really exciting projects going on right now where some of the investment funds locally owned are seeing that they can build workforce housing and know that their return is going to be lesser now but in the long term it will return more i think we need to have private partnerships with those people to really bring on board more workforce housing immediately in neighborhoods and provide what government incentives you can do the third thing is i think it is tied to we don't want all those people coming from outside and i agree with carrie moon on that we need more apprenticeship programs i talked earlier today about how we have some of the best companies in this area and the best labor unions we need to partner with kids when they're you know young and build those internships those labor ready jobs so that there's good family wages thank you thank you <laughs> Uh, this will be the last question before your one minute closing statements, and it's a 30 second question. We'll start with you, Justin Farrell. Um, Seattle's 2014 uh, investments in bus service uh, through Proposition 1 uh, will expire in 2020 during your term in office if you're elected. Um, this includes $2 million a year for the Youth Orca program and other programs that improve transit access for low income riders. What do you think the city should do to extend or replace those funds? So those, um, those service hours were put in place in part to respond to the loss of service hours from the Great Recession and also to respond to the fact that this is a growing city. So we absolutely need to replace those hours and in fact grow them. And so it would, in an ideal world, we're working regionally to do that and let's start there and work with King County and other places to build out metro service to and from Seattle and within the city. But at the end of the day, the city has a deep interest in maintaining those service hours and growing them, and so we need to look at all options, whether it's doing it by ourselves or working together. So as a Seattle Public Schools teacher, and I'm actually gonna, not within the school district, but as a co-curricular teacher, if I could go first when we do our closing statement, I need to go give a commencement speech to some middle schoolers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of middle schoolers, it's very important that we find ways to expand our current ORCA program. Uh, we just simply do not have enough free bus passes that are accessible to young people for getting to and from school, and the cost of transportation now is way too high. So one way that we can respond to instead of continuing these levies is we can look at things like ad space or where are we currently spending our money. Uh, one example is we spend a lot of money advertising transportation at things like the sports fields and we know that who comes to the sports field is not all Seattle based people. If we can start spending our fiscal resources that we have for transportation better, we could have a better transportation system. We're incredibly fiscally irresponsible, and yet we continue to leverage people's property taxes from a $5.6 billion budget, uh, 1.2 general fund. So instead of thinking about renewal now, what I want to think about is fiscal responsibility now. So when renewal comes up, we've actually worked ourselves out of this regressive tax structure that actually puts the burden of taxation upon people who already have less. 
The other thing is we really have to pursue comprehensive tax reform and be very specific about where those funds go. They should go to transportation, education, affordable housing, and addressing the state of emergency around homelessness. I just want to note, I gave, I added an extra minute, but everybody else gets uh, 30 seconds for this question because we're going to have your, uh, your closing statements. Um, so, uh, Bob has a Okay. So, uh, we have a little bit of time before the, the uh, thing expires. I think that we need to have a moratorium on regressive taxation for the timing until we get a grip on where we're at because we, m many of us here are not really seeing the full gentrification displacement that's happening out there. We need to get a grip on the resources we have available to us right now. In the meantime, if we establish the public bank, that will raise revenue without raising taxes. We need to get that thing up and running, and that can absorb a lot of the time Not the time. <laughs> Renew the levy. I think it's essential because it goes towards underserved uh, communities and it goes towards the Orca Lift program, the Youth Orca. We absolutely have to keep that funding in place. That said, longer picture or bigger picture, longer term, we have to look at more progressive taxation statewide because we all know the only way we're going to be the city we want to be is if we have sufficient revenue to invest in kids, to invest in the next generation, to invest in equity. So long term, we have to look at a capital gains tax, a more progressive B&O tax, closing tax loopholes, everything I've talked about before, more progressive taxation is the long term answer. This levy has been essential to some of the mobility we've had, so I think we should probably extend it. But we need to make sure that we're directing funds in the right place, and I would look at making sure I would subsidize more ORCA lift passes and the like, so people who don't have access to transit will have more easily access to transit. The second thing we have to do is it's got to be a regional solution. One reason we passed and needed these service hours is because the regional approach failed. And, every, and the other levies were voted down, and so we had to fill the gap with Seattle. So as a member of the Sound Transit Board, the mayor has to work on those regional solutions to make sure that Seattle doesn't have to go it alone. These have got to be regional solutions, and that's what I'd work for. Thank you. So when the King County ballot measure failed, me and some other great activists filed a ballot measure with the city saying we're going to go out and collect signatures and vote for it ourselves. And within just a couple of weeks, the city council, the mayor, and the county executive were all for doing it. And one of the reasons I did it is if you wait for the state or the region to build for us, they're always going to focus on state or regional needs. We need to connect our neighborhoods to each other. So this city needs to be willing to finance transit. And we did a transit master plan that's enabling us now to get federal money for some of our things. We have our own funding, and that means that we can control our own destiny. So yes, absolutely renew with a more progressive tax source. And now you all have one minute for closing statements, and we'll start with Bob Haskell. So thank you for having me here and giving me your consideration. I believe that I'm the best qualified to be your next mayor with your approval because I have the experience in managing transformational organizational change within a multi-million dollar organization in my history. Uh, I've gone to the uh, Evans School and got the MPA there, in which case I went to the Immaculate Board and I found out that there are over 50% of the people over 55 were displaced or homeless because of displacement. That's why it's such a crucial concern to me to not continue forward with regressive taxation. We have to stop that. We keep going to the same well. So I have uh, the experience and I have the money management uh, capacity and I have the plan for financing many of the city's uh, restrictive financing problems because the, it's financing that is the root of most of the problems or is the solution actually to all of our problems. would appreciate your good support. It has been great to be here tonight with you all. When I started working in activism for urban planning and urban growth and urban development and transit-based transportation systems, 
we did not have this resource of all the brain power of people in this room and all the many organizations, Seattle Greenways, Bike Club, uh, Transit, Transportation Choices, FutureWise, the amount of energy and intelligence in this room is what we need to get us to the city that we all know we can be. With our wealth, with our progressive values, with the brain power in this room, with our commitment to equitable urbanism, there's nothing we can't accomplish. And I would be honored to work with you as mayor to lead us all together towards a city that is committed to sustainability, to shared prosperity, that's inclusive, that's welcoming, and that is creative and innovative as we know Seattle can be. I would love your endorsements. Thanks. I don't think this election for mayor is just about who's going to be the mayor for the next four years. I think it is about what is our city going to be in the next generation. Seattle is at this incredible crossroads. We have seen you know, great economic growth and prosperity, but with it has become challenges that I think are really taxing our system. The homeless situation breaks our hearts. Affordability is a real crisis right now. People can't rent or live in the city. And we've seen wage gaps increasing. And so when we think about that city in the future, we know the solutions have to come from the urban areas. Donald Trump has made it clear that he does not share our values on climate, on affordability, on wage issues, on labor. We have to lead and on each of those issues. I believe that the mayor is gonna be the person that can help lead us to that generation for the next generation. When I, my kids are here 20 and 30 years from now, I want Seattle to be the same city that's loved, but it's the new city we all want. So I really love these topics. I love them so much that I took my experience volunteering in my neighborhood as a community council president and volunteering for the Sierra Club, you know, to quit my job and form a nonprofit that was focused on how do you demonstrate public demand for these things, oftentimes which are controversial and difficult. And I want to say something. It's really easy to say something progressive in front of a progressive audience. Uh -huh. It's a lot harder to do something progressive when you know that the papers, or, you know, the Seattle Times is going to editorialize against you, the Democratic Party is going to say you're out of touch, and maybe you have to walk into a town hall full of a couple of hundred people. I've done that. I've done it with regard to bike lanes. I did it by saying the viaduct was wrong. I did it by fighting back an attempt to link highways to light rail. We got it back alone, you know? And now I see these crowds and these people willing to fight for this. And I know, I know I've talked a lot about what I've done in the past, but when I see all of this, kind of thinking the times are catching up to us here and catching up to me. So I really want to keep working on this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for listening to all of us tonight. I think we have shared a lot of great ideas around transportation, land use, livability, equity. Um, what I would say is that as a legislator, I have the skills to work with city council to be able to deliver on these things we care about. As someone who has worked at the executive level at a transit agency, I've worked on budgets, I've worked with a large workforce. We need someone who can steward our tax dollars and work with our city employees to get these dreams that we've all talked about done. And as an activist, as a nonprofit director, I've worked with communities and I've worked with grassroots activists and we need all of us here at the table to realize these dreams about our cities. And I would love our city. And I would love to have all of you um, with me as we work on these issues that we care so much about. So thank you so much for your time this evening and I would love your support. applause for all of our candidates. We'll be back at uh, 7 o'clock uh, for our City Council Position 8 candidate uh, meeting. So we'll see you in a few minutes.